Hello everyone and welcome. I'm very excited today because we have Dr. Stefania on the line today who's going to share some different ideas around hormones. We've been talking about hormones for the last few weeks and uh, we feel like we've covered quite a bit but I wanted to show some of the connections between sugar and cortisol and stress and and how we can kind of tie all the bits and bobs together so um, so welcome so nice to have you here thank you thanks for having me so tell us like what is you know going on with hormones why do hormones get out of balance well the funny thing about hormones is um, you know we're able to measure them with numbers and actually see what they're doing on paper but there's a whole lot going on behind the scenes and hormones, you know, we have so many of them, you know, it's like a great big concert in our body. So when one gets too loud, another one in comparison is going to be too quiet. And that's where a lot of imbalance comes in. So I find one of the hormones that kind of runs the show for everybody else is cortisol. Um, and cortisol, as um, people may or may not know, is our get up and go, sort of our stress coping hormone it comes mm -hmm. from our adrenal glands. Once that gets high, it throws off um, quite a bit more. So yeah, that's, that's I always a big like to describe it. cortisol kind of like, you know, sitting on top of a pyramid, um, sort of like the chief and, you know, everyone else kind of falls in line. And if cortisol needs lots of stuff and it, you know, uses up all the goodies in the body, then everybody else <laughs> basically doesn't get what they need, you know. So, yeah. That's a really good way to put it. You know, um, you know, and cortisol is a funny thing. You know, when you first have a lot of stress, cortisol gets high. But after a long time, you kind of run out of its building blocks. So you might feel stressed, but your cortisol is later low. Oh, yeah. Um, and like you said, it competes. Mm. So, you know, cortisol and progesterone have the same building block. So women that have things that are what we call estrogen dominant and endometriosis is one of those. Um, sometimes when cortisol is high for a really long time, you don't make enough progesterone anymore. You don't have the building block for it. Yeah. So what then, then that's when uh, estrogen sort of runs amok. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so what would you recommend if one has hormone imbalance? What are the things that you would look at? First, I want to understand what makes a woman tick. What, what happens? What is her type of stress? There's different stress types. There's wired. There's tired. There's worried. Those are kind of the, you know, the three main ones that you see the most. Mm. With that information, you know, the proper herbs can be prescribed for sure. Um, but even deeper than that, is this a woman that craves sugar? Yeah. If you're craving sugar, that's definitely a cortisol thing. And and, we're, and the reason we go to sugar is usually for comfort. Yeah, I also find, like, for me, I'm, I'm a big sugar person. I know when I'm feeling stressed is when I instantly want chocolate. I'm like, okay, I need to look at what I'm stressed about rather than wanting the chocolate. But to me, it's like, it's a little bit of a an energy booster. So if you, you know, if you've been running through a lot of cortisol, inevitably you're going to feel quite tired. And so for me, it's like, oh, I need chocolate. <laughs> and I was like, oh, hang on a second. <laughs> What's going on as to why I need that chocolate? So I agree. I think um, when we find out what we really need to comfort, this is a huge part of healing the inside. Mm. Things that you cannot test with anything. There are no numbers for what you're comforting. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and that's, then when and that's we a look question there. Of, of looking deeper, you know, so yes, we can surface level go, oh, my cortisol's out, my estrogen's high, my progesterone's low, you know, whatever the hormone situation is, and we can try and treat that. But if we're not addressing the triggers for that, well, we're always going to have that situation going on. So, you know, looking deeper and going, well, what's driving the stress? You know, like for mm -hmm. me, looking at, well, you know, why do I feel stressed? What's what's triggering that stress response? Because everybody's in situations and some people handle those situations like they can totally cope and they get on with life and they just deal with it. Others of us make it into this huge thing or it affects us in a way that really, you know, kind of throws us and we've got to question, well, why is that? What is it about you know, within us that makes us respond to that. 
I think a lot of it has to do with our memories as well. You know, uh, what have we experienced before? Because our brain always tells us that's happening again. Yeah. Whether it was childhood, teenage years, you know, further into adulthood, there's a part of us that goes, I've seen this before. I know what's happening. And we expect the same things to happen over and over. So looking at the memories is a really good place to start. Mm -hmm. Cool. So what is the sugar connection? Like what, you know, why, why do we need to look at sugar or why should we kind of, you know, ascertain why we need sugar or how do we reduce sugar or what is the, the kind of loop that's happening with sugar? Is it, you know, you have sugar and that triggers a response or is it the other way around? Like what's happening there? Well, there's a couple of things happening. One is that for the brain, the sugar is pleasing um, so it can often help us increase our dopamine, and dopamine is one of the, the hormones that's in, involved in actual addictions. Um, also, um, that comfort level of sugar is very interesting because it's both stimulating and comforting and relaxing at the same time. And there aren't that many molecules in the world that do both. We want both. We want to like get up and go, but we also want to chill. And sugar does both of those for us. And it tastes good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's that. Also, cortisol has um, several different jobs in the body. And one of them is it will increase your blood sugar. It will take the stored sugar from your liver and it will put it into your bloodstream. That's part of how it helps you get up and go. So when cortisol, it's like you don't have enough cortisol to do its job. Maybe you've been stressed for a while and now that number is starting to come down. Sugar is almost a replacement for what your body is wanting, which is we've got a lot more to do today. So that, that's kind of how that all plays mm, in together. Mm. So then you'll crave. What about caffeine? Like how does that fit into that picture? Um, caffeine is interesting because, yes, it gives you get up and go for sure, but it can be really, really taxing to the nervous system. And caffeine also often comes with a, a pretty hard crash. It also makes your body release more cortisol. Mm. So even though you have a lot of get up and go, people that use a lot of caffeine, especially high caffeine beverages like coffee, over time, you don't have the, the stores of cortisol to respond. So you almost end up needing more caffeine to get uh, that same spike that you want. Yeah. That's how some people are like, you know, they start off with a cup or two of coffee and several months later, they're having maybe four cups to mm, get the same mm, response. Mm. It's because they don't have the cortisol built up anymore to be able to spike when they drink the caffeine. Okay, yeah, because I've, I've recently tried drinking coffee again, like, you know, because I, I generally didn't drink coffee, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll try it, you know, because I found this really yummy chocolate drink, and the idea of chocolate and coffee together is always quite nice, so I thought, oh, I'll give this a try. <laughs> And what I noticed, which was interesting, the first few days, it was fantastic. You know, suddenly I had this burst of energy in the morning. But then what started to happen is my anxiety levels actually started to go up again. You know, so I started noticing that that cortisol obviously was spiking. Mm -hmm. And so it was causing me more of this anxiety. And then this nasty loop starts happening because you're in a state of anxiety, which means you can't sleep as well. So then you wake up tired. So then you need more coffee. And it's just like, you know, this yeah. vicious kind of cycle. Um, so how would you guide someone if they were pumped up on caffeine, pumped up on sugars, they need to get out of that loop, but they don't quite know how. How would you guide someone to do that? I think it makes the most sense to do more than one thing. One is never quit the caffeine cold turkey because you'll probably get a headache, feel terrible, be cranky, be exhausted, be just really horrible to be around, <laughs> but to um, reduce it by half each day. So say you're having four cups, go to two, go to one, go to half, you know, and like that, kind of a wean down approach. The other thing is um, you need to really look at what your sleep habits are doing such as most of us in this culture uh, and in this day and age, we're on our phones late. Mm. So there's a blue light that's coming from the electronic device that's going into the eyes and then the brain, which is very stimulatory. So if you're having trouble falling asleep, the phone actually has to be put down at least 30 minutes before bed so that your brain can stop making those brain waves and start going into more of a relaxation mode. Mm. Um, and then find something to do that actually relaxes the mind. It could be read a book, could be a warm bath. 
Um, could be even talk on the phone. Something to replace the phone. Yeah. Because yeah. we're creatures of habit. If you just take the phone away, you're going to be like, so what do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> it's like part of my routine. Yeah. 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 I like to do yoga or do some deep breathing or, you know, just mm-hmm. kind of have a little bit of a routine that you take as a personal me time, you know, that nourishing time to go, okay, let's just reflect on the day, just chill out, you know, and try and try and stop all the kind of what I call monkey brain thinking, you know, overthinking, analyzing everything. So mm-hmm. yeah, cool. So what um, about, one more like, thing I want to add to that really quick yeah. is that there's a lot of herbs that support the adrenals called adaptogens mm. that can be very, very helpful as the adrenals are healing. Now that has to be prescribed properly because some herbs increase cortisol, some decrease cortisol. So you need to make sure that you're choosing the right one there. Yeah, and based on where you're personally at, you know. So, I mean, I I love adaptogens, but I found some of them too stimulating. Like ginseng can Mm -hmm. be incredibly stimulating, which actually invigorates that anxiety feeling for some people. And, and, you know, like my husband, he does great on ginseng, but I don't. So it's kind of, you know, fitting into what works for you. Um, But, yeah, adaptogens are amazing. Um, And particularly around periods in your life where you know you're going to be stressed or you know like if you're doing exams or anything you know where you kind of almost predict that there is going to be some element of stress there it's it's good to have something there um one of my favorites is actually rescue remedy which is Uh is designed more for you know flying or you know if you if you have a short-term thing but i actually found that to be really beneficial just to have a little bit you know during exam time just to help you through that Um, And, Mm -hmm. of course, supporting yourself, you know, making sure that you're drinking enough water, that you're eating, that you're, you know, not just (laughs) running on into the other levels because, you know, that can create a a type of anxiety in the body. It's like, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, like, give me what I need. (laughs) You know, if you think about a baby, they don't get what they need, they stop crying. Well, that's Mm because they need something. (laughs) You know, it's the same sort of thing. Yeah. We just don't cry anymore. But... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So cool. All right. Well, so in terms of hormone balance, like what would be kind of the, your protocol? Like if you were working with a client, what would be the areas that you would focus on? Quite honestly, what I focus on the most is what's going on with the mind Mm -hmm. and and the lifestyle and the habits and, and getting rid of what I call the micro nose or the micro drains. So We have a ton of different things all day long, most of us who are new to this work, that stress us out, and a lot of them are unnecessary. So talking about sleep-wake, kind of like we're talking about today, some people don't realize how rough their morning routine is on their mind. Mm -hmm. Um, For instance, they wake up to a horrible noise that is their alarm, like that "Ah, ah," noise, which does not have to be. So their very first thought in the morning is a survival mode thought already. Yeah. Or they're pressing snooze a lot, which actually is very harmful to the adrenals. Um, And then they're getting out of bed late now, you know, and it's like we start with the morning routine. What, what, what's your alarm like? Are you hitting snooze? Are you you ready for your day? What are your first thoughts about? Um, You know, how prepared are you? All of these things that actually make your morning go a whole lot smoother. And then you go, I didn't know it could be this way. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I'm like that. Like. I used to, I never did alarms, like, I just couldn't do alarms, because I would wake up with a bolt, and then just be irritated the minute I woke up, because I was woken (laughs) up, so I just didn't do alarms, but I found for myself that if I get up early, like, if I get up, you know, ideally, sort of 6 or 7 a.m., like, if I can get up earlier, I have a calmness around the day, because I'm like, I've got plenty of time got lots of time to do everything that I need to do but the minute mm-hmm. I have a sleep in even though sometimes we need a sleep in I have this mental kind of thing around that where it's like I've got to catch up I've already mm-hmm. missed three hours of the day and I go through this the day with this kind of panic stricken feeling of missing out um, mm-hmm. which is interesting because then it starts to apply to everything you know it's like suddenly it's yeah. like all the nasty habits creep in um, so that's one of the things that I've picked up about myself. And it's it's interesting because there's always kind of a mindset around expansion or retraction. 
you know, mm-hmm. do you wake up in the morning and feel expansion? Every opportunity is available to me. I feel like I can breathe, you know, and this is what yoga does for me. Like I just find if I do my yoga, it's like the whole day shifts. Whereas if you're in the contraction mode, it's like I didn't get enough sleep. I'm feeling tired. I'm sore. I'm, you know, it's all the thoughts are that kind of restrictive contraction. And I find with women with endo, this is quite common that we, you know, have this feeling of feeling stuck, of being restricted, of, you know, and that's why we're very conscious of not using words like diet because it has that implication of restriction. Um, Mm -hmm. So trying to think of ways, well, how can you make, you know, your morning routine expansive? Like what things can you bring into that to make you feel expansive? Um, Like gratitude diaries, you know, fantastic because it's expansive. It's opening your, your eyes to all the things that you have that you hadn't thought about. Um, You know, so anything like that, I love doing. I agree. I think, um, Part of why my style developed the way it do- it did is because I realized that some women, even with the most impeccable diet, just the right herbs, she could possibly even be on hormone replacement therapy, regular yoga practice. If her mind was saying, this isn't enough, did I do this perfectly? Oh no, I had that one bite of this, that means I messed up. If the, her mind was still that contracted feeling that you're describing, it didn't matter what herbs I prescribed. Yeah. It didn't matter like what the numbers were. She was still tight and like, mm. oh, so mm. stressed. Mm. So it's, it's got to be included in, in her, her treatment. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So can you give us three takeaways that we can just start doing just in terms of trying to balance our hormones? You know, what are some of the three key things that you would, would like to share? When it comes to hormones, you want to make sure that you're allowing yourself to eat when you're hungry um, and to make sure that you're getting enough protein. And that does not mean that you have to eat meat, but when the blood sugar spikes and drops, if you're too hungry or you're you're not eating enough uh, either protein or fat even, uh, you're going to have a lot more hormone hormone imbalance. Um, One of the best ways to do that is to make sure you're having a little something on the bookends of your day within 30 minutes of waking, within 30 minutes of sleep. So you get one apple, you split it in half, you have one on each end, and you have a teaspoon, I'm sorry, a tablespoon of like a nut or seed butter with it. Some people, they wait too long to have breakfast or they think they have to go without food about three hours before bed. Only if that works for you. It has Mm. to be what works for you. Mm. So balancing the blood sugar like that is super important. Hormone imbalance also is, um, it's about relaxing balanced with action. So, you know, action is like the testosterone and the estrogen and relaxing is like the progesterone. So life has to do the same thing. Mm. We can't be all action. And if you're too relaxing, even you were saying, you know, if you have a sleep in, you're like, oh man, I didn't do enough today. So our hormones are the same way. We have to do both. We have to balance that out. Yeah. Um, For a third one, it's really, really important to connect to either people that you love or something greater or nature. There has to be a sense of connection, and there's even studies done in Okinawa, um, which I'm sure you know uh, is uh, over in Japan, where the people that live the longest have the healthiest lives, the healthiest, happiest bodies are the people that are in um, connection with other people and something greater. Mm. So that has to be there too. Yeah, community sense or church or whatever that is for for the person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's often underestimated, you know, like in, in certain cultures, it's very, they're very family orientated and the family is, is sort of central to every decision. But I found, you know, the further away we, we move from that, the more this feeling of isolation comes into play. It's interesting Mm -hmm. how more health conditions start to come up as well. So, yeah. (laughs) It does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing your insights with us. We, um, we've you. been going on this journey with uh, trying to unfunk our hormones in the last few weeks. And, uh, you know, it's nice to have it all kind of brought together in, in one sort of session and, and get the insights. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>